Welcome to The Lost Signals discusses philosophy, narrative, and the mechanics of criticism. In this show, we analyze the greatest minds of narratology, both classic and current. Enjoy. Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Oh, I'm just going to make up this title now. The Lost Signals explores uh, literary theory. <laughs> Delves into literary. Uh, um Welcome, fellow uh, people who have heard of Bakhtin. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've heard of him now. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> We're discussing the discourse in the novel. I'm Jonathan E. Manzer, here with Stephen Ramosi. Hello. And Scott Thurlow. And I've always had two voices. Yes. So, uh, actually, I should, this is not the discourse in the novel, which is one of four essays yeah. written by Bakhtin. This is the discourse in the novel, Abridged. Yeah. Because we're reading what I imagine was uh, a edited version for a class. Yeah, like selections only, from... Only 65 pages of the 120 or whatever. Whatever it might be. 70. I was going to read the entire thing prior to this, but <laughs> yeah, I got a, better things to do. Life got in the way. Yeah. Um, so, we're, But we're going to discuss what this section has. And it's going to be the section we post on uh, below the... Uh, and we'll put it in the link. Yeah. So this is a very passionate argument for the importance of the novel, especially written in a sense at the time when it seems that the novel wasn't getting much respect. <laughs> or I, uh, I'm sorry, before you go on, like it's that, and also at least what I took from it was a different way of studying the novel uh, as opposed to yeah. yeah. I, I was going to okay. get to that. Okay, my bad. Where the, the initial part of this uh, work discusses how the novel was analyzed mm. uh, w during the era. I believe it was... Can someone look up the date? I'm looking it up right now, yeah. actually. So, so, Discourse in the Novel. Uh, Hit us with the date. Okay, well, I'll continue talking while yeah, you please. Yeah. Uh, so, it was studied very much like a poem was studied, in that the voice and language of a poem is the author of the poem. And, yes. 1981. Much later than I think you expected. This, this came out. I, th yeah. I thought it was written earlier in Russia, though. Uh, perhaps. Maybe yeah. not 81 yeah. was the... I have it copyrighted 81, but I believe it was, I believe the case is that it was originally uh, at least produced I don't have an earlier. initial... Gotcha. Well, I will put in the description of this the date that... Uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out. out. But, Fix it in post. So... That the poem is written through a uh, uh, looking at the yes. Do you have a you, you nodded and said? I think I have uh, a better one. It was yeah. uh, forty five. I think. No, that makes yeah. The sense. copyright is from the the university where it's reprinted, mm -hmm. but not originally written. Yeah. Is all that that was the uh, issue here, Gawney. And and in that uh, those who studied poetics, those who studied and uh, linguistics, and this is true to the linguistics today, are always looking for the one voice, the uh, the ultimate, like the one guide to how everything is The one is true uh, word, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, or if you have the, like, no matter what language you study in linguistics, it all goes back to kind of these abstract mm. uh, concepts that can be applied to any language. So he is his argument is that the novel doesn't work quite like that, in that there are always at least two voices. Present in it, yeah. yeah. Uh, in a... Uh, novel and oftentimes many more mm -hmm. than that. Exactly. And then he goes into the differences between different forms of uh, kind of not only the novel but other types of speech. So you have conversational speech between like two people and that develops that back and forth that you're building off of each other's language. You have rhetorical, even one person speaking to an audience that still has a certain dialogue yeah, there. Exactly. But novels deal with so many more facets such as there's temporal aspects to it which mm. you have uh you have class aspects you have that's what i was going to mention uh, yeah. professional aspects where you have jargon in one language um person you have uh, gender you have all of these different little tiny aspects that all to use a uh 
a Barthian term, mm-hmm. kind of a braid of different voices coming together to form the novel. Exactly. Yeah, that's very well said uh, as a summary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like, it's basically uh, I have it. He uses this word a lot. Um, in the essays is the stratification of language. So as you say, like, you got your professional level, you got your, your social sort of like man on the street. It's like, I believe he does bring up like the issue of like vulgar levels of language, like yeah. sort of the Latin yeah, yeah, thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So all these things are sort of like floating around in society, like in actual use. Mm-hmm. But as applied to a novel, then you have to be aware, as you said, that these are all incorporated in the voice of the novel, in quotes. So, yeah, you have. I'm, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, if I may. Uh, yeah. I, I I would like to make a correction. It was actually, according to Wikipedia, between 34 and 35 is when he, uh, when he actually as well. wrote it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, when I mentioned temporal nature uh, before, it also uh, – actually, I'm going to uh, go back for a little bit because I'm a big fan of Frega, as you guys know, and this kind of goes into it where I imagine that. you – have a objective referent that they're discussing, right. but the sense, the context with which you're discussing that thing uh, is dependent upon the person in the novel who's speaking about it, but also, in a sense, what they were trying to say at that point uh, and what, they're, what you then read 20 years later, 100 Into years it. later, right. 100 years later, yeah. and how that context of where that person existed in um, society and what they're, t- refer- or what they're talking about changes right. all of that as well. So it's, I-, I can see this as kind of the bridge between the, just the strict ob- objective uh, look at works and just what, what was the author trying to say at this specific, uh, specific right. time to the modern day style of, well, it's your interpretation, uh, or your, it's not the author anymore, but the well, reader out of it instead. and their yeah. context that they're bringing to it, which was interesting because he does make some cool points, even though I'm more of the, I guess, the former look at things. Well, yeah. I was going to bring up the fact that, so you mentioned your, your, you know, your frigging, if you will, you subscribe to that sort of uh, angle and analysis, but it's also, uh, you're a big fan of set theory, yeah. which it seems like while he does not say that directly, <laughs> In any of the essays, it seems to me like, for example, I have in my notes uh, sort of a paraphrase that various languages don't exclude each other but intersect each other. So you can almost have like sets of them, like I said, the stratification, which, as I said, a word he does use. Um, that's sort of where the set theory comes in, where a subset of languages is then encapsulated in the a voice of a character within a novel, which of course is reflective above the voice of the actual author and, mm-hmm. and so forth. Yeah, so. He, he he talks a lot about uh, heteroglossia in this. Um, which is a word he I, invented. I will, I will say, I went and did a little further a research on, that. on yeah. heteroglossy because, in terms of this work, I was not always necessarily sure what the hell he was talking about. It's a little <laughs> dense, say. we'll say. It's pretty dense. Um, <clears throat> so the idea of heteroglossy, like kind of the idea of the coexistence of, and I, I have this written, yeah. I have a note of this, the coexistence of distinct varieties right. within a single language, mm-hmm. um, which I think really cleared a lot of things up for me in terms of what he was talking about. Like the, this idea of like multiple ways of viewing uh, what what's being said within uh, a work. Any given work. As... Yeah you can look at it from different vantage points, right? Like, so you have the characters in the novel and their uh, viewpoint. You have the author's viewpoint. Mm-hmm. You have the viewpoint of the people, of, of the audience who are right. reading it as well. And, like, in terms of the time that it's written in. And then you have it being viewed, like, later on and in a later time and looking back on it. And, and in, the, the in terms of... And has not yeah, changed, of in, course. Yeah, right. In terms of, like trying to see what trying to figure out what they were talking about in that time based on what you know now in a in a later vantage point and like i think that's i think that is the core of this and i think that he tends to go on a bit (laughs) well uh, it's it's certainly one of the cores and yes he does in terms of like uh you know he he does belabor points yeah that is well said but i but i think that the core of what we're trying to look at is looking at a work uh, especially novels I, i feel like he kind of um 
excludes poems from this. Like, well, it doesn't. It, at, 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 at a. Well, well I'm, I'm, he doesn't exclude them, but his, his focus is obviously the novelistic form. Right. So, he, he talks a lot about poems and, and kind of is like, hey, poems ain't this. You right. know, like. Uh, he, he compares them and contrasts po- them as well. Poems are the author's voice and that's how you interpret poems and he's not challenging the orthodox of how people at his point analyze poems right yeah he's saying yeah. that the novel is should not be analyzed a much the same different way poems form are. and therefore requires a different kind of yes. analysis exactly. and i don't disagree with him in that regard mm-hmm. that poems and novels should be looked at differently but i do kind of disagree with his initial point i think that poems are much less uh, Heteroglossius? Uh, I think he views poems as like a single point of reference, whereas he views mm. novels as like multiple points of reference. And I, I don't know if I agree with that, but it does raise interesting questions in terms of like looking at the two uh, forms. Three points quickly. Mm-hmm. One, we've only read about a quarter of the actual work. Sure. Uh, so we ourselves so are blinded by a, a, a narrow head of glass here. Two, <laughs> I don't believe it's in the scope of what he's discussing, and he makes it clear mm. that the separation there is uh, on purpose. Yeah, there is a footnote or two. And two, about I don't that. also, and as I've just brought up, I don't think that he wanted his work to include poems because that would be a direct challenge to, again, the orthodoxy mm. and would detract from. Even no matter what he believed about it, and he might have gone on for three quarters of the uh, rest of the work sure. uh, discussing, um, but like he didn't want to, it to be an argument over how poems are analyzed, but more over just in a sense the novel. Right, he was yeah. th- clearly focusing on that. Like we At said, least, uh, that I mean, one like, thing. so so like I I actually kind of thought that at first, but mm-hmm. then he continues to talk about poems and like bring them up as like a counterpoint throughout, and like. Yeah, well, like I said, so he it's clear them. it's clear that he's thinking about them in oh, yeah. terms of of like how the, his uh, understanding of the written word works, right? So, I think uh, this is a fair point for me to make is that you're looking through it through just the authorship, uh, while I'm looking through the braid of both the author mm. and in heteroglossia <laughs> of the works and those who would come around for it. Well, like you said, or, like so, yeah. Come for, those who would argue <laughs> against him. I think it'd be interesting to see what he thinks about because he doesn't mention uh, scholarly works at all in this. <laughs> in terms of like, you, well, know, you have you have he fiction, you have fiction novels yeah. and you have poems. He does briefly discuss scholarly works. He mentions them. Yeah. He, he, he glosses over them. We'll say a little yeah. bit, but no, like going back to your to your sort of uh, Barthian braid kind mm-hmm. of idea, like. Again, while he does not directly reference that, which he probably couldn't have, but there, he uses the term, again, in quotes, double-voicedness, which is, one of you had said that that is an element that is certainly present and needs to be considered and or analyzed mm. uh, when regarding a novel, whereas that's sort of absent in, in poetry. Mm. And like I think that's what you're maybe you were trying to get at, Steve, or at least yeah. mentioning that. Yeah, he, he, he brings it up multiple times, for sure. But I think, again, it's for the contrast to, as you said, Ian, he's like... We're not. I'm not trying to focus on, or at least break the orthodoxy of this one, but we do have to consider a different way mm-hmm. of analyzing this other kind of genre in a broad way, and and also keeping in mind all these aspects that were not as um, broadly or often analyzed or included in uh, analytical works of them. I actually do until have, that time. I actually do have a, a quote about poems. Uh, all right. Hit me. In kind of. I, I thought at the time of reading that this encapsulated kind of like what he thought about mm-hmm. uh, poetry versus uh, like the novelistic uh, viewpoint, which is, he says, in poetry, even discourse about doubts must be cast in discourse that cannot be doubted. So it's it's like this idea of poetry does not have as many avenues of understanding i guess it's kind of yeah it's kind of like a i get what you mean yeah one idea about poetry the unitary voice cannot in a sense cast doubt on itself right uh where in a novel now i'm i'm extrapolating off of what i read for this so Mm. i'm speaking for uh sure uh, him uh because you can have multiple voices then that actual arguments can surface yeah yeah and i 
I, that's true. And so I want to kind of build on that or at least introduce another angle that at least I extrapolated from it. So it's the idea that languages itself are, I guess, the culture or and or social aspect that a language quote unquote belongs to can sometimes be myopic. So it can it cannot exceed itself beyond itself in a sense, right? So that aspect has to sort of be considered as well when analyzing work and when analyzing uh, a novel and or an author's intent within that novel and with all the characters and so forth, with all the languages, like sub-languages, I guess mm -hmm. we'll call them, that may be present within, again, a given work. Let me, which let I thought me, was an interesting idea. Let me ask you guys this. Uh, what do you think about his take on uh, heteroglossia, right? Like, what do, you, what do you think about the, the idea, idea of, it? Mm. of viewing, I guess, you know, novelistic works or, or longer works or, you know, works of fiction, not only within uh, the way they're written, but also within the context that they are and, and also within the context that you're reading them. Right, like viewing them as somebody who is removed from the context that they were actually written in, which is necessarily the case even if you read it a year after I mean, it came yeah, out. And right? he like, says that very thing, I believe. Yeah. In fact, the minute it leaves the author's hand, it now has a gap. No longer. Yeah, the there, there's a second exactly. viewpoint. Yeah. The, For the sure. minute a second person reads it, mm -hmm. there's a second viewpoint, right? Like, so what do you guys? What do you guys um, kind of think about? the authorial um uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, use your I, words I want to say like indignation but like that's not mm, the right nah. that's not the right phrase for it like what, what do you think about like the authorial version of it versus everyone else's interpretation of it do you think that every the other interpretations are as Valid, we'll say, or valid <laughs> as what the author mm. thinks of his own work uh, versus. Well, you're asking. Like, I mean, I, I, I think, like, and the other thing is, I think that the author of something will invariably think differently of his own work yeah, after of reading it again than when he was first writing. He or she was first writing it, right? Sure. So, I mean, like, you have that second viewpoint. That seems that obvious. Level of heteroglossy. Yeah. So, like, I guess so you asked, yes, like. Originally, one question now becomes like two or three. Yeah. So I'll try to address them all like quickly one at a time. I do think the idea of the head of glossy itself is completely valid. And again, perhaps because he was sort of introducing it at a time when it it was a new thing or like he was coming up with this theory, right? It wasn't really uh, a consideration in other academic studies mm -hmm. at the time. So I think it's completely valid. And it, within. I don't, I don't know if it was or not. <laughs> no, Prop, Prop and Campbell were both about the kind of singular, like that there's a kind of a unitary uh, uh, kind of vision. To sure. And he's somewhat, I think he's somewhat yeah. on the other end of that. So I think it's interesting, but I think it's an important consideration because I do buy into it to an extent, maybe to a, a bigger extent than you might, Steve-O. More perhaps, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not coming down one way or another okay. at the, at the moment, but like perhaps this is more like, in the vein of Sontag, as I think we mentioned, right? Oh, like, certainly. Uh, you know, you mm, maybe you need to view this in terms of. It more is that than it's, it's the bridge between uh, those. I do like that. That right. sort of it sort of kind of cuts up the difference He's a little bit. Yeah. Looking into the context of what the author's intent was and when it was uh, written, right? Yeah. This I feel had a big influence in later or in the modern day yeah, look at it uh, certainly depression. seems to be the case with uh, within our limited research that we did like about it itself but i will say like yeah like it seems to me like glaringly obvious that certainly you have to consider as he says the the social dash historical aspects mm -hmm. of any given work like which ties into the uh, the whole idea and definition of his heteroglossia right i don't see how you can ignore those aspects and try to analyze a work and get something out of it yeah. so this is uh, i <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I'm more of an uh, authorial, however. Uh, authorial, I think I said. Authorial, I think, yeah, yes, I guess, I guess sure. that's probably sure. Uh, I'm more interested in what the author considered for the work than what modern day interpretations are. And granted, yeah, you have to consider that there are emerging, even if it wasn't the intent of the author, there are emerging social yes, aspects of it. Exactly. There's things that you can't escape from your time. Dickens wrote about being in England at that um, sure. uh, age. Uh, Hemingway wrote based on his experience. So you can't escape 
the impact of the social situation right. it's, at the it's time. It's like inevitable, right? But I think I read them because they're the ambassadors from that point. From that era. And I definitely mm-hmm. look into more so what the author was intending. And there's an argument to be made that you might never you, know. Uh, we're going to actually bring this up in our next work we actually read, but mm. can, if you're, we're all, we've all dabbled at being writers in the past. Sure. Can we write women? I mean, it's a good question. Would ever be, if his theory in my mind of the heterodoxy of, it's if correct. I have a female character in my work, am I capturing the female experience in my work? Or, Am I limited in only capturing my experience? Right. Are you doing, of, is it basically a copy of a copy of a copy? Like yes. More or less. I get what you're saying. Sure. And like, I don't know how to answer that. Like, m- maybe it could be. It seems to me like a, you're, certainly there's a limit to how much you can uh, encapsulate as an author or how much you can imbue into a work, mm-hmm. given the limitations of who you are as a person in whatever you know, historical, social era you might be happen to be alive in and writing within. So, right. I'll say, Good, Steve. Uh, in terms of this argument, I think personally, my view of it is you can write whatever you want to write as long as you understand your limitations as a writer, right? Like, yeah. you, uh, listen, you're never going to fully encapsulate what it is like to be a fucking woman because you're not a woman who you haven't had the experiences that a woman has. But the the, the other thing is, like, you can take that, like, in many the ways, you've aspect. never, literally, no woman has ever had the experience that the woman that you're going to write has had. Yeah, no, but <laughs> the thing is, so, but this goes back to his thing: the language of what a uh, a fifty year old adult male has versus my experience, or. Mm. If I'm James Patterson attempting to write a 13 year old uh, <laughs> dialogue for, uh-huh. uh, am I capturing the heteroglossia uh, of the, uh, the uh, like the true heteroglossia wheel yeah. of that yeah. um, a demographic? I guess we'll call it. Um, it's I, I cast my doubts that it's always there's a filter of the author first and foremost, no matter what they're writing, and they might some people might do it better than others. Sure, but. And I don't think that to stop people from doing mm. it, but by just saying that, like, every single character in that has its own unique language, it's predominantly the author mixed in with stereo. I actually think stereotypes in culture of now. I, I don't mean stereotypes right. negatively, no, but it's what I feel a. If you do, I'm going to add a female character. There. I'm just using this example. I'm going to do the matron. I'm going to do the crone. Right, I'm going like to do the mother. I'm basically, going to do archetypes. The, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. archetypes. And I feel that's how it more works, and which goes very much against, I think, what he's arguing here. I don't know if that's the case. Like, I, I so like I, I'll say this. Like, in terms of to take it to its logical end, the question that you just asked is like, can I write a woman? Uh, but that's not. Can I write anyone who isn't me? Yeah, that, well, that's well, what I was that, going to say. That's exactly the, what I was going right, to say. Is right, like the logical yeah. end of that is like, can I write a single? If I'm not writing an autobiography, can I write this book? And of course, you can fucking write it. Like the fact is that you need to understand your limitations, and you need to do your research as a writer. But, but, so and you, and and the fact and and if you do your research as a writer, you are you are entering, I guess the the heteroglossic. Uh, realm, uh, realm, yeah. or no, whatever. No, I, like, I get what you want. You're, to say, you're, yeah. you're, you're trying to understand what the social impacts of the things that are happening on the character that you're writing are, and you have to do that. You can't write anyone. You can't write fiction without doing that. Without yeah, I get to what you mean. Without <laughs> sure, you know, <laughs> f- fucking up in, to some degree, and like not writing the character correctly, right? But like, if you can, if you can, if you can. Get in if you can to any degree get into the head of the character that you're writing, whether it be a woman, whether it be a person of color, whether it be you know anyone who isn't you, whether it be a white boy who looks just like me but has different experiences than me, Mm -hmm. like then you're that's what fiction is. Like the the, it's 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 a it's a writing something that it's it's a going out on a limb, writing something you don't know. You know, Mm -hmm. like. That's sure. exactly what fiction is. It, it doesn't matter who you're writing about, uh, mm, and to some degree, fiction. to some degree, you have more experience as, uh, writing about a you know thirty 
two year old or however old you are, white guy for sure, than you do a seven year old woman, a hundred percent. But like that doesn't mean that you can't try to inhabit that thing and uh, like or that character, if I say that mindset. I shouldn't have said that thing. That that character and um. You know, like, that's what you kind of need to do. And, like, in terms of, I, I think we've gotten a little bit far afield in this, but, like, to bring it back, I think that's a little bit what he's talking about is, like, you need to view all aspects of the characters in the novels that that you're trying to study. Or en- encapsulate, we'll say. And yeah. to, that, uh, to that notion, I have a short quote that I would like to read. Where he talks about the study to study the word, ignoring the impulse that reaches out beyond it is just as senseless as to study psychological experience outside of the context of that real life towards which it was directed and by which it was determined. Um, so quote, sure. So like it's it's the idea of like in order to study or to in fact write anything. You can't just. I mean, you can't do it have, in a vacuum. Essentially, you can't, you can't just write it. You need to n- kind of know your subject to now. some degree. So you know, uh, I'll address uh, some of it briefly. One of you mentioned like stereotypes, like not necessarily negative. It's I believe he uses the word refractions, right? So mm-hmm. any character you write, regardless, is a refraction of a your experience and again your the the heteroglossia and what you fall under when when and whatever it may be. So, of course, it's going to be the case. Yeah. Like, of course, I've considered that. Like, it's almost like, I don't want to delve into it, but the problem with consciousness. Is anyone going to understand a fucking word I write who isn't me? Right? Maybe not. Of course. Of but, course. But they certainly. Will. They will yeah. understand, understand them in their own way. Yes. Certainly, there's something to extract from there. But I'm just saying, like, it seems to me, uh, as you guys are, tell me if this isn't what you're putting forth, that his, at least some of his argument, some of his points is that. It wasn't previously done like that. All those aspects weren't as often or as frequently considered when analyzing novelistic works, or at least to the degree that he says they should be. That they should again keep all this stuff in mind. That this, all these factors, if you will, like these sets of sets, matter when you're trying to interpret, you know, the use of language and the use of story as a whole in this genre. Is it getting solipsistic in here? Or is it just, me? <laughs> it's just you, man. It's just you. I'm not even here. So, Scott, I'm going to bring up a. I'm going to derail this conversation, even though it's a good conversation for a second, by bringing up another point he makes. Sure. Mars. Mars forever. What about it? Interesting. <laughs> like, that's the, the point he makes. Uh, uh, that you can. That's my you instinctual a, reaction a, to a, it. A, I can make a reference to an object mm-hmm. without any context in it. What about it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, like your natural inclination there is either to say what about it or like, like yeah. So or some reference uh, because you want context of what I'm about to say to it, mm. or um, you might say like, w- like, what do you want me to say to that? Like you're trying to yourself bring parse it out. It. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, I, I I thought that was a very interesting and I think very salient point that he made about just the need in a way for a lot of these braids to occur mm. is to provide context. To Again, I just you said, can't just have them in isolation. Yeah. Like you said, like mm. some kind of bridging the gap between them. Like you're right. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm. There's certainly context. Like always like that's just regardless of anything going to be the case mm. in all instances, we'll say the senses, uh, he arguing the sense is necessary for the referent to yeah. have any meaning. Yeah. 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 Well said. Mm-hmm. I like that. And I think, I mean, I agree with that point. It might have taken him a while to get to that, but... but. I, I think he just, it's one paragraph he says early on anyway, and then moves on to talking about uh, rhetoric. There mm-hmm. is there is a lot of this, I, I will say, uh, to um, do a little bit of shitting on this article. <laughs> there's a lot of... We'll say it's meandering. Yeah, I mean, it's not, not necessarily meandering. Yeah. It's a lot of, like, trying to hammer home a point that I don't necessarily fully know why he's trying to hammer it home like i guess i like i want him to get to the point a lot in this while but i was think reading this way this. he was a sort of and, somewhat and of a, we read a very short version of it mm. 
I would bridge version, but it, like I want to just be like, get to the fucking point, man. Just tell me what you want to tell me. You know what? That might prove his point. Like, it, allow me to uh, put forth to you. Because he was writing at a time in which these studies weren't being as done. Like, we're like 70, 80 years more than that removed, right, from the original uh, you know, when he was th- you know, publishing this stuff or yeah. producing it, right? So I'm, what I'm saying is like, at that point, it wasn't as well, like this wasn't as widely uh, encapsulated in academia in general or even like in people just analyzing works in general. So like I'm just saying it has to come from somewhere. So maybe that might be why like it seems like he's belaboring points like too much to a degree. Mm-hmm. But think of it think of the heteroglacia, if you will, is because it wasn't as much it wasn't as done as much at that time. You know what it strikes me as? <laughs> Go on. Yes. It feels like he's dictating this work to like a secretary <laughs> and then never edited it and, no because he's just like, like it felt very impassioned now, that's why i liked sure. reading about it is yeah. Yeah, I, I he was clearly he into this material yeah and he just felt like he was wildly like uh, maybe even like, like ranting drunkenly <laughs> ranting about this topic yeah. it's like or maybe he was trying to get his dissertation done in like three days yeah and uh <laughs> just typing away it, it, it it worked for the most part, although yeah, you're 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 absolutely right about that. it's at times like, come on, man, I, I, yeah, I get it, I get it, like just, just I got you. Fucking tell me I, what I you want. I one day want to read the entire thing, yeah, just which, to see which, how much said, I'm like. It was your original intent to do so, well, but I read probably about thirty pages that uh, right on you top guys of didn't read these selections. And sure, it very very similar. Yeah, very, I mean, much, did, did, much it, of the did same? it change much or add, or add much or just like again more of it? Uh, I think I have a greater understanding of poem versus novel mm. Mm. than you guys got. Because uh, he delved into it a bit more? Sure. Yeah, but uh, it wasn't, I don't think, much different. Sure. Yeah. But no, I mean, I guess I'll say, like, in general, it wasn't, like, the best. <laughs> I'm not knocking it. It was an enjoyable read. Like, I, I almost, of course, we're always interested in this stuff, this material, in a general way. And it's why we do this, uh, you know, this show, The Philosophy of Narrative. But it, I think it could have been a bit more streamlined, but again, now I'm wavering on it because of every, the thing I just said, whereas he was coming up with these theories, or at least introducing these, these mm-hmm. angles of thought into the uh, the studies of language and novels at the time, which, again, were not quite well applied. Yeah, I mean, uh, so like... Or as widely applied, that is. What, what I really... I actually got kind of into it right at the end um, because I felt like he was kind of getting to the point at the end <laughs> and uh there there's a point where he says every age reaccentuates the works of its most immediate past and yeah. i was thinking about and, and what i really like about that is i was uh, you know putting that on top of our podcast as a whole and thinking about us doing the afi mm-hmm. list and the ways that we reaccentuate them grade the <laughs> grade the mm-hmm. movies of the past like the 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 gr- quote unquote great movies of the past that like some of them we have not been kind to you know like these movies like Duck Soup and some like It Hot mm. where Heather Glass like, does not stand up man these movies were hugely successful and very popular back then and we watch them now we have an entirely different viewpoint on this mm-hmm. on these sure. type of things and like that that's kind of like that was the part that kind of made me think about. Them this type of stuff is like, you know, the, these stories that were told, you know, X years removed, or 30, whatever. 40, yeah. 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, some of them we have absolutely loved the Charlie Chaplin movies uh, to, to name a couple. And like some of them like just don't hold up anymore. Or at least in, according to in us, terms of us <laughs> yeah. like some people still love them for sure. But hmm. give you an interesting example. I think Charlie Chaplin's a great, uh, Example of the timeless because the man down on his luck is always a character and character an actual person. With. Yeah, uh, some like it hot is kind of like the social story aspects are so, much aspects different. I've changed quite yeah, a bit exactly. in order to, yeah. yeah. So I think that Charlie Chaplin will always kind of be. At least an endearing character. Because it's of more of a, a widely swath archetype yes. than the verse. And again, as we said... The, that goes more towards the universal types than it does to Right, the, sure. Uh, but still, like... So, like, that's kind of what I was thinking of it yeah. in terms of, is, like, you know, like, 
I was trying to put this into real world terms, and especially for us, like the things that we focus on, like we're going through the FI Top 100 as part of this podcast, and like I love laying these um, broader ideas about stories on top mm. of the things that we're actually looking at, and like in terms of that, like I I saw it so clearly. It was like, oh yes, this is how we're redefining things in terms of how we're living in twenty. 6 15 through 2019 when we started the podcast through now sure. uh versus you know how they versus were previously. accepted in the i don't know when some like it came out the 30s maybe 50s the 50s you know, but yeah, it's, Ooh, it's a bit, bad it's a bit much difference but not like that I, I have one of my quotes or at least you because you mentioned it the concept of uh re-accentuation which i thought was again one of his like yeah. more interesting ones uh, it's that languages morph and are used are, are, are changed in social historical fluidity. Thus, th- all analysis must take that into account for this fact, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, it, again, it seems obvious, but somebody had to point it out. And I feel like he was one of the ones who, like, initially at least introduced that, like, concept or injected it into academic analysis. And which we have continued uh, in a, to a degree, to an extent, to this day. Yeah. So I want to discuss, to start with two novels quickly. Have ever, any of you read Don Quixote? I've read parts of it. I never actually read the whole thing. I have not. I read the first half of it. Uh, when it, I think that might be in the same yeah. boat, yeah. Uh, it's the endearing buffoon. The charming mm-hmm. uh, idiot, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the first modern novel, as it's often uh, called. And you can see why that character archetype has lasted for so mm-hmm. long. Mm-hmm. I just read uh, Gogol's Dead Souls, which I doubt any of you have read. <laughs> I know I of it. Not. I know of it, but we've discussed it, but I've never read it. It's it's really fascinating work because it uh, by kind of like dealing with how it's really particular to its time. Mm. Right. And you have to keep that in mind. It was, you'd think Bakken would say. But it's also a satire of kind of those universal archetypes of different types of rich people. Mm. Mm. And it's so you can appreciate it while reading it because that hasn't changed even though the... The specifics temporal, might be different. Like, yeah. Yeah, the, the, because it's really a satire of its time. On the other hand, you have uh, Mark Twain, as we mentioned earlier, right. uh, with Huckleberry Finn, which has recently gone through a... A look, a look through a modern lens yeah, without exactly. at all acknowledging kind of like the historical and authorial mm. look at it. Uh, so it's it's interesting how people like, how they're viewed in, in a way in how general. how this type of work has influenced people in their reading of work. Mm. Where yeah, I, sure. as I look at things only through what. At that moment, what the intent was, or you try to, or I try to. Yeah, yeah, I'll never know. Yeah, what I don't think you can best, perfectly yeah, do yeah, that. Of course, right? so the best of our yeah, capabilities. I, I built a time machine <laughs> just to just go to back do that. to that point. Even if you build the time machine, you still have your uh, experiences. Yeah. From Greatest now. use of time machine ever. <laughs> I wipe it all. <laughs> <laughs> start over. Yeah. <laughs> Nineteen. Why am I here? I start over. Nineteen thirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. But no, like in all yeah. seriousness, I think, like as we just said, like I think it was. An interesting thing to encounter mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. think about like like again this sort of angle study had to originate from somewhere and like I'm not saying he's a sole like author, again mm-hmm. authorial of it but certainly one of the progenitors of it mm-hmm. which I, I think I'm more in line with his general way of his general method of putting forth analyzing works in such a way than I'm against it okay. so yeah, like Wall might, like as you said, Wall might be like a denser-ish read, and he might belabor some things here and there, mm. perhaps more than here and there. But nevertheless, I think the core points which we just discussed stand more than they don't stand at this point. And I think we, as you said, we almost apply a similar kind of structure to our own uh, art, if you will, our own podcast. Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with that. Like, I, I tend to look at things always. You know, if you don't know something about. An, uh, a work of art going in you're always going to view it from your own whatever you have first but like so often now we get outside information mm. later that it's affects easily, the way that you no. view the work because like how can it not like you even if it's just someone else's 
hot take on a fucking <laughs> movie or something, right? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, that's going to impact whether you agree with it or not. It's going to impact how you uh, it might change your view interpretation the work to one degree or another. Like it's going to it's going to say, "Hey, oh, I agree with this person or I disagree with this person." And that is going to change to some degree, a large or a small degree, how you view what that work is. And I think that is what he's talking about, the header glossier, right? Like, hmm. is like there are outside influences that affect how you see, how you see something. And also, but in the construction of a work as well. And, and yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I think that both of those stand like as valid and legit things. I am out of topics. <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. This is a good one. Yeah, it was solid. Like you know, it's again, it's not the easiest work to read, but if you can get into it, if you can extract the points that we just said, and may, if you want to read more, we will certainly, like I said, put the link. But do you want to read more? Yeah, it was solid <laughs> enough. Well, I'm Jonathan Ian Manser, and I'm my own author of the world. <laughs> so uh, aren't we all? I'm here with my fictional compatriot Stephen Rosa. Hello, I'll see you later. <laughs> Good one. I, I did like it. Ouch. <laughs> and Scott Thurlow. And I'm bocking the fuck out. See you next time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Lost Signals Discusses Philosophy, Narrative, and the Mechanics of Criticism. Editing and Engineering by Jonathan Ian Manzer. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates.